Perfect. Um, well, Carlos will be joining us here in the He was finishing up a different call. Um, how is everyone? Good. Good. It's Wednesday. Great. Yes. 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 Great. Uh, now, when we speak, because this is the first time we've done a Zoom call in this room like this, can you hear us pretty clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah, we they installed this brand new um, all room speaker. It looks like a ceiling tile and um, it picks up really well. And it's supposed to have some kind of digital filter that filters out like when the air conditioning kicks on or the Keurig machine. But obviously you can hear the Keurig machine. So maybe maybe it's not as high tech as they say. Uh, and Jared, can you just forward Carlos the um, email one more time? I. The, he tried to click on the link that I had sent him from your email, but it's not working for him, he said. No problem. Well, you're doing that. Um, maybe I'll just kind of recap what's on the on the board right now. So the, the, last, the last time we all got together, um, I think everyone was maybe at their own house, uh, a little different than the classroom. So I think we've tried every setting. We've been in person. Everyone's been online. And now you guys have been in the classroom while we're online. So um, to recap from, from last time, well, I guess the last couple of times, the first thing that we've started out with was the challenge. And this was identifying the true need that you're solving for. The next thing was um, learn. And this was combined with customer feedback to help narrow in, or maybe it might alter the need you're solving for. From there, we went to ideation. And ideation, again, involved feedback from people based upon um, your idea. And it may even further give you insights that change um, your, the need you're solving for or how you're approaching the problem. So if you guys remember, we did the uh, bug, well, it was cooking spray versus bug killer spray. And they both, because of brand standards, they both looked the same. and felt the same, but obviously they do two uh, drastically different things. This is where feedback um, definitely comes into play and could prevent a lot of problems within a company. So essentially, as we're, as we're taking this journey, we're starting out um, where it's kind of a roller coaster, right? So the idea phase is kind of at the peak. This is where you're really dreaming, where you're thinking of every potential option that possibly could happen. You're, you're designing for the extremes. You're saying, all right, what's our Disneyland experience and what's the most simple thing that could possibly happen? Um, this, this path, oftentimes throughout an organization, and I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but usually that part of, of the idea phase or ideation doesn't happen within most organizations. Typically what they do is they say, um, a good example. All right, we all need to work from home. So they say, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, let's uh, make sure everyone has a laptop. Let's make sure everyone has Zoom capabilities and they have internet, right? So they kind of went up this, this path. They learned or they had the problem. They learned about it. They thought of some solutions and then that was it. They deployed it versus saying, okay, everyone needs to work from home. How do we create a Disney experience for them at home? How do we deliver all of their, their products, their belongings? How do we send them something that maybe is sentimental to them from work in the mail that they can have? How do we provide them every tool possible to be successful at home? Which would include the obvious, right? A laptop, internet, um, access to Zoom. But again, it's a completely different path that most organizations miss out on. So today, we're going to move from really being able to dream and we're going to start coming down on this journey. And it starts all with the concept phase. So hold on one second here. Let me just move past this. And maybe before I jump into that, Jared, did you guys have any conversation around that or any questions that came out of uh, last session? No, we, um, on Monday, we spent some time talking about feedback and just what that is 
and we actually watched a TED talk about feedback um, to try and make sure that we really understood what we're asking for when we're talking about it. And um, uh, the, the thing that came out of that was a good quote where feedback creates um, a partnership. It doesn't put you on trial. And um, how when you're searching for feedback, you really are trying to hold up a mirror. You're not just trying to look out a window and give your perspective and tell someone, but you're also trying to get them to see things about you know, themselves or their project or whatever. So we kind of drilled down on feedback a little bit on Monday just to kind of make sure we understood that concept. Perfect. And that's, that's usually, and we, we talked about it slightly when we talked about feedback, but a lot of times people will fall in love with their, their solution or their product, or um, we call it falling in love with their baby, right? They, um, let's say they design the most revolutionary pin you know, that you can write with, it's multicolored, it's got all these functions, it, I, I don't know, it, it telescopes, any, any function, but they love it. And then when they go and seek feedback, they just dismiss feedback because they love their idea. And that happens, I can't tell you how many times. So when you do go for feedback, you have to have a very objective mind knowing that you're asking for feedback and people are going to give it to you, but you want the right kind of feedback. But if you ask for it, you need to be willing to accept it, even as difficult as it may be, even if someone um, tells you that, hey, I don't think your product's good, right? That happens a lot, and people want to defend it right away versus ask, well, why, why is that? Why do you think this? Um, help me understand more, because they may find it one tweak, but by being defensive, they're not willing to listen to that. The other thing I would say around feedback is make sure you're getting it from the right people. We did talk about that as well, but I think we've all probably experienced the like parental feedback um, where you go show your parents something and they're like, oh yeah, that's great. You know, they, they don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, now that's not every parent, but for the most part, everyone kind of knows that that feedback that your parents give you where it's constructive, they're not really gonna say a ton that may be negative because they believe in you and wanna you know, foster you to continue to, to move forward. So when you ask for feedback, you really wanna ask people that are, again, objective, but I mean, com complete strangers, people that are disconnected with you emotionally, people that are disconnected with your product emotionally. And by disconnected, I don't mean to, won't care about it, but just have no emotional tie to anything that's going on. So. When it comes to feedback, really evaluate who you're getting feedback from uh, because you want to get the right feedback. Great. Um, all right. Well, we're going to move on to concept. So, and I think Carlos was able to get in. I, I believe so. Carlos, you there? Yes, I'm here. All right. Perfect. All right. So, with concept, uh, as the slide says in front of you, it is pretty straightforward. And when we talk about ideas and getting feedback, this is typically what happens out of it. You either love it, you hate it, or you evolve it. Um, those are really the options in which we live in. So I, Carlos, if you wanna add on to that. Yeah, sure. So, um... Think of it, uh, first of all, once you get uh, the, the feedback from, from your ideas, um, when you get to the concept phase, the, the step that gets you there is that um, it could be as scientific, but also as conversational as possible. And let me explain. Um, you can have uh, something that has been voted on, something that uh, you know, people have reacted to. Because um, when you're getting the feedback, um, maybe the one thing that I would add to uh, what Jeff explained is feedback doesn't necessarily have to be delivered in the format of conversations all the time. Um, meaning you have the ability to create some fun engagements in which people have the ability to literally uh, uh, demonstrate either agreement or disagreement around an idea. Uh, one of the ideas that we always give for this is uh, the uh, we use a lot of spectrums. So picture uh, having an idea that uh, says white on one side and blue on the other. 
um, instead of having to go into an explanation of people having to vote to whether it's one side blue and the other one's white, uh, you have the ability to just buy, you know, instruct people by approximation and say, you know, go and position yourself in the color in which you most like or the approximation to the color that you most like. So this, this would give you an example of how then you can have a conversation if somebody stands in the middle, if somebody stands halfway from the middle to, you know, white to the middle. Anyway, um, so the feedback then has the same possibility to be voted on. And, and, and again, it could be as uh, literal as people voting on an idea or the one that had, uh, you know, you can, you can make assumptions, educated assumptions of saying the idea in, in which people gravitated towards or engaged the most. And that gets you to the concept phase. And again, uh, one, one, of the, one of the most important steps in the concept development is you have to make a decision whether you're going to love it, meaning you have, you have gotten very minimal constructive feedback. Uh, everybody really likes the construct of your feedback. Um, and then you can evolve, you know, you, you can continue to evolve now. It's more the usability and sort of, I mean, you know, really getting into the MVP side of it, which I think we're going to get a little bit into that or hate it. And, you know, when we say hate it, it's, it's, it's obviously to, to make the point where you, you kill the idea. Don't, uh, so if you, if you find yourself where the feedback is really not uh, building the idea any longer, or it has too many arguments against it, um, you have the option to kill it. Or the last one is evolve it. And, and evolving mean, means in a, both in a meaningful way, obviously if you have an idea that it's not performing, um, you need to make sure that the evolution is significant enough so that you can really bring it back to the equation, back to the conversation or evolve it based on the feedback, right? Uh, may, maybe there is not necessarily a love it, uh, you know, uh, range, but it's getting very close. So get as much as feedback as possible so you can evolve it to something that people then will easily check, check off and, and, and agree with. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next page and we'll talk about this. So, Again, this, this is what a concept should look like, right? So this is pretty easy for most everyone to visualize or understand that it's a rough idea of either a oversized iPhone or it's an iPad. Um, but they have just literally cut out little squares, pieces, um, parts of maybe their idea. Uh, there, there appears to be building an app, right? So it's, it's purely reaching out, understanding feedback from people and saying, hey, do you like the layout of this? Uh, here's, here's a concept or, or an idea that we've, we've brought along the process and now it's starting to become a little more real and we want you to, to test it out. We want you to provide feedback um, based upon, you know, hey, this is where you click this or this is, this is what you're, dashboard would look like right so all of these things that people can interact with and actually give to what carlos said constructive feedback um, about just kind of the the shell of the idea and oftentimes this step um, and we see it a lot from being connected to the startup world this step gets missed a lot of times uh if you if you think of an app right let's say you have an idea for an app you're like, hey, it's going to be a um, access app for me and my me and my friends through through school to be able to communicate with our teachers. A lot of times in the in the tech world, we see this step get missed because they say, okay, I just need to talk to my teacher. I'm just going to you know write some code. I'm going to put some buttons where they need to be, and now I'm going to talk to my teacher. And they already go deploy. They spend some money. They they create functions. And then when they realize that the adoption of their idea isn't that great, or the, um, maybe the layout doesn't quite work for people, all of a sudden then they start asking the questions of like, well, why don't you like this? Why isn't it user friendly? What, what could we change to do it? Versus if they would have done this on the front side, it could have saved time, but also money. And that when they launched their product, it had a better adoption rate. So, um, 
the concept phase is extremely important because if all the feedback they got truly was, you know what, the, the dashboard of this gives me no facts, right? I don't care about this assignment. I don't care about what, you know, um, how, how I get to the class. I don't care about the room number. I literally care about what do I need to do? What's my progress within the class and what's my grade? That's what should be on the front. But if they never ask those questions to begin with, it's going to be really hard to develop a product, a service, or an experience to put into the marketplace. Hopefully, hopefully that makes, makes sense. Yeah. You're muted there, Carlos. Um, it said, can you hear me now? It said host yeah. muted you. Yeah, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I was going to also talk about is, you know, the image here portrays something that I think it's very relevant to all of us, which is technology at this point. But, um, and we always get this question, right? Because I think that it's easier for you to think through a concept, especially if you're going to use some creativity with some paper and uh, some stock paper and, and, and just, you know, markers and crayons um, to create, um, a, you know, an interface of an app. Um, but I also want to provide just examples that, um, and make actually the point that almost anything can be drawn and put into a concept. One of the examples that I always provide is actually Bluebeam. Um, you know, so when we, when we started doing the concept development for Bluebeam, and especially on the layout and business model, actually, I'm going to talk about the business model more because I think layout, again, it would be easy to put, you know, to draw it up. But the, when I would present the concept of Bluebeam, in order to make the concept, uh, you know, uh, something that you could physically engage, what I literally did was I created a separation of uh, boxes that had the, the percentage representation of what, what the model was going to be. So, uh, you know, I, I represented co-work as primarily 60%. So it was a box and I actually tried to make a rectangle out of it. If you can start, you know, imagining what I'm, what I'm describing. Um, so it was, it was a box that represented pretty much 60%. Then we talked about the coffee shop that represented about 30%. And then I uh, talked about the uh, consulting side that was back then, you know, version 1.0 was uh, considered to be a smaller uh, part of, of the business. But then the conversation really went how I seeked, how I saw it, the, the feedback was um, I would put all these cut out papers and make this rectangle. And I would say, according to the feedback that I've gotten today, this is what Bluebeam would actually be. So again, putting all the pieces together, um, I had the ability to create this larger rectangle. But then, and, and for anybody who's heard me say about, you know, especially tell the story about the coffee shop, the coffee shop was something that was introduced as a um, as, as an idea to make the concept viable in Ankeny, in, in, in the suburbs. And uh, one of the things that, um, you know, we just naturally reacted as humans, and this is, you know, primarily my wife and I was, well, we don't know much about coffee. So there was already a, a, an, a, an intrinsic fear of uh, accepting this feedback. So going back to the concept and, and looking at this, imagine this, e again, this, this image of the business model where again, part of it, you know, 60% was the, the co-work side and then you had 30% coffee shop and then you had 10%. What I would do was, what I would do is I would actually remove the coffee shop and, and, and again, physically. So the person who I'm requesting feedback on the concept was literally watching me move this piece from this already perfect tri uh, uh, a rectangle. And then I would make my statement and I would say, I would really want to have your feedback if we remove the coffee shop element out of the business model. And then the question would be, what do you think is going to happen to this business model? Through that conversation, through that concept development is where I got so much validation that if I were to remove the coffee shop, then my journey on adoption would be really steep, hard, and almost even impossible in a way. Because the, then the challenge really uh, 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 sort of transformed into, can you really introduce such a new concept to a community that is really not used to it? So is the adoption going to be what you're, what you're looking for? So 
wanted to provide this exercise because I, again, I think that every time that we present this, people uh, sometimes tend to uh, assume that concept development is easier for tangible products and it's not the case. I mean, literally you can provide any type of drawing and even as conceptual as it is, I mean, think of Disney, um, you know, you can still put it in a piece of paper and then, you know, just literally put, uh, you know, draw up business models and then start having just by, you know, geometric, uh, geometric division, start having those arguments about what parts of the concept make sense, which ones go together, so on and so forth. And I think, um, Jared, you and I had talked about an interesting exercise that I think you uh, we're going to, are going to deploy. So I think, I think that'll be good. And one, one way to think of, uh, the starting from just a shape to a final project is, I don't know if you guys have ever through school seen, you know, uh, like an art book, right. Where they teach you how to draw a duck and they start off with like a triangle, a circle and some squares. Right. And then all of a sudden you start making those a little, you, they have a little more definition and then you keep adding and they have a little more definition and by the time you're done and, and you're flipping through this book of how to draw, you know, quote unquote, a duck, it literally looks like a duck at the end. But when they started, it was just rough outlines of, of shapes of, OK, well, this is approximately where the head's going to go. This is approximately where the body is going to go. Um, one of the things we touched on, I think it was last time, was the power of feedback at this stage. And the reason it's so important to have these shapes, like Carlos said, are just very low resolution options for people to get feedback is they will always relate the effort put in to the feedback they're willing to give. So again, if you just put four, four pieces of paper in front of me that are different colored and say, Hey, how would you, you know, in, in the blue bean uh, example, put these together or how would you validate certain parts of this? People are probably going to give you some pretty good feedback because they see you probably just cut out pieces of paper and it didn't take you long. But again, if you go all the way to an app um, in this, or if think of if Carlos would have built Bluebeam and then asked for feedback and it looked completely different than it does today, but everyone said, well, why didn't you put a coffee shop in there? It's a lot harder to make any changes, but also people are probably less likely to tell him you should have had a coffee shop because the building's built. They, they would evaluate that, wow, a lot of time and money went into this. It is what it is. I don't want to, you know, give feedback that may change or alter how it looks today because it's going to cost a lot of money and you've already put in a lot of time. So again, really evaluate using this step and make sure that you leverage it to get good feedback because people will ultimately give you the feedback from the time you've committed to the project so far. It makes sense. Um, all right. So again, here's the recap of that. So pretty straightforward. You love it, you hate it, or you evolve it. Now we're going to go into test. So wait, you're not done testing and learning. So again, we talk about these dashed lines. Um, and now you have this black one that comes out of, well, you actually have two. You have one that goes all the way back to learn. And then you have one that goes all the way back to the challenge. So one of the things to do is, again, get feedback on whatever um, optimal solution you've landed on and, and bring it back to make sure it, it not only aligns with what you've learned or um, you know, ideated or, or how the process has progressed, but also you bring it all the way back to the beginning to make sure that wherever you landed, you're still solving for the need of whoever you're targeting. Or has it shifted? Has your target, has your best customer shifted? Um, but really understand that when you bring it all the way back, you're solving for a need. If you get to the end of the process and you've just created something you like, but it doesn't check the box of solving for someone else's need, it's going to be a miss. Do you want to add to that, Maybe Carlos? One, yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing, so pre-COVID, um, when we would show this slide, we would get quite a bit of um, just, I'm going to say, I don't think it's fair to say pushback, but when we would be in front of clients, 
I think that this is the part where they had, I guess, the most discomfort in, in, in what we were sort of describing. Because, I mean, if you obviously, if you look at the black line, um, it's really telling you that some of this takes you right back to um, reframing the challenge and puts you really on square one. And this, again, this is where we would talk about the term, and, and, and by the way, um, there's, there's really two ways of reacting to this word. Some people react to it and uh, sort of wrap around, wrap their minds around a negative connotation, uh, which it's not. And actually, if you have any comments, I would love to make make the argument, primarily because that's how I like to have my my title. But disruption, I'm talking about disruption, right? Um, then we would say, hey, so uh, if something were to disrupt your industry, and that's where we would lose people, where they were like, ah, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, but really, how how realistic is that? So now we fast forward to our current reality, and this, you know, this this black line has become very relevant, very real, um, in, you know, almost in everyone's world, right? I mean, we have been impacted, and the question though about having you having you as an individual or your business um, uh, or, or your vision having the ability to go back and have a reset on the whole, uh, you know, offer value proposition approach is something that, again, I don't think that many, uh, you know, um, just businesses have had the opportunity or maybe stomach to do. But this is really what that represents is does your, you know, from, from, uh, from an organization perspective, does your organization have the ability to really rethink itself and adapt with all the available variable pieces? Because there's going to be some fix. And, you know, I'm going to make some obvious correlations. Um, you know, if you think about uh, brick and mortar, actually, the, the room that you guys are, are right now in, in, inside, um, there's, there's a lot you can do with the furniture, but there's very little you're going to be able to do with the space, right? I mean, you have some boundaries around you and you've got walls. I mean, and if you need to, and especially if, if movement requires agility, there are going to be some things that are going to be out of scope. And, and even in, in, in the, you know, in, in the spirit of a crisis, um, you know, you wouldn't want to spend your time painting the room, but it's more of the ability of the furniture. So I'm, I'm actually going to leverage that as an example of um, we use we use this analogy quite a bit when people are defining or building business models, uh, call it objective goals, whatever it is, even from a personal perspective, you know, your um, so I'm, here's here's the the provocation. Um, and let's just keep it to personal goals, right? Your professional uh, personal goals. Does your goal include wheels? Now let me explain. Um, in the room that you have, and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to make out. I think that the tables have wheels. Um, I'm not sure if if I'm right or wrong, but yes, that, that okay. So so that would be one element of transformation that you want to make sure that you incorporate in your strategy, right? So when you're purchasing furniture, um, one thing to consider, and, and, and trust me, there will be an add-on to the price, right? And I don't know if you guys have ever done this. I'm telling you, you know, uh, in Bluebeam, I, I definitely know this, but a table, a working table, collaboration table with wheels is more expensive than the one that doesn't because of that mobility. But even that though, it's an easy transformation um, uh, option. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start making some, some connections here with the analogy. So if you have a room, if you're gonna build a room and you wanna have the ability to transform, the bare minimum that you should consider is to put some wheels on every single piece of furniture because when the time comes, when the need is there, it's literally just a matter of unlocking the wheels and moving some furniture around. So from our perspective, it would be a miss for you not to consider putting the casters on your, on your, uh, on your uh, furniture. But now let's, now the other aspect to see is make sure that you're not blinded by, by the type of transformation that your organization has the ability to do. So having wheels first and foremost is something that um, all or if not many already have. 
Um, some organizations forget that they have wheels, so they don't move, you know, the, the furniture because they've never had to do it. But in a way, it's and, and that's something that we always say is, you know, and, and, and literally you can do this in physical spaces. There's a lot of times where you're going to see a, a furniture, a piece of furniture, and it has wheels. And especially if they reside on top of any type of carpet or soft, if you move it around and you can see that that, you know, furniture has really sedimented itself there you know that that's never been moved. So the whole transformation ability has never been deployed. <clears throat> the obvious ways of transformation, especially from a concept perspective, right, from a solution, uh, if, if you would be in, in this challenge, um, one of the things that we, uh, we, we got to inter interact with in this, uh, in, in this period with Jeff was that a lot of our clients thought that because they had deployed a strategy to be remote, uh, like literally what we're doing right now, that signified a good um, sort of behavior of transformation. And it was, a, it, was, it was sort of like a hard conversation to have when we would have to provide the feedback and say, well, you know what? Um, first of all, it's a good reaction, but it's not necessarily innovative. Right. I mean, you 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 may have felt it that way because your organization never really opened up to the ability of the wheels. Right. So you you never leveraged, uh, you know, this virtual ability. So that was the hard part of, you know, that was the challenge was that this was the first time that you needed to figure out how to unlock the wheels and move the furniture. But the reality of making something new is not there. So going back to, would that have been a, uh, a black dotted line? No, it wouldn't. Um, it was just something that it was, it was sort of like a patch. Now reinventing yourself, you know, even having the ability to say, how can we take, tear those tables apart and, you know, look at the fact that you've got quite a bit of wood, right? You've got quite a bit of surface you've got some frames, you've got some wheels, and then come up with a new solution, a new type of furniture that, that you can build, that would be considered transformation. So I'm, I'm painting all of that because again, at the beginning, you know, pre-COVID, it was very hard for us to make this argument without in a way losing people uh, on the fact or maybe the thought that, uh, yeah, this is not gonna happen. This, could, this would be so hard for it to be real. Now it's a little bit of the opposite, right? Now we have the ability to um, it happen, but our challenge now is to make sure that people understand that there is really uh, a transformative change versus incremental change and versus obvious change. And in, in, your, in your concept and your solution, when you are deploying this, that's the same way that you have to assess the results. Um, you are going to have some feedback that is going to become, you know, even when you have already a solution out there, um, reality will calibrate the, the optimal level of your solution. You have to have the ability to either, you know, make it better with the current, uh, you know, characteristics that make up your solution, or you have to have the ability and stomach to go right back to the challenge and then make the best out of the feedback and again, you, you need to make a. Oh. Your screen popped off for a second, Carlos. You're muted. Right. I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I would, I would add one, one disclaimer is um, don't come in on Friday and tear apart all the desks before uh, Jared gets in that this was not a, a free pass to tear apart all the tables. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a hypothetical uh, situation. Correct. If you do though, I would uh, really appreciate some pictures of whatever you guys create. Um, but we are not responsible for new tables if you choose to go that path. We, um, might, we might try and find a way to rearrange blue bean on Saturday. Mm -hmm. That uh, might be better. Field trip. <laughs> just don't touch my desk and then we're good. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, any questions about that? That was a lot of information to take in and I just want to maybe flip it back to if anyone has any questions about either the concept or even the, the testing part. We have a couple more slides, but I just want to make a pause. I've got one question. It's more about the feedback. Yeah. Um, is, is there ever a time when you have a group of people giving feedback and 
you have a collective majority that, you know, gives you one idea that is just, even though a lot of people like the idea, it's just a bad idea. Um, yes. So if, if typically what will happen is if someone provides that idea, so, well, first off, gaining feedback, right? Some, you can either gain it in groups or you can gain it one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of times it's beneficial and, and we find to, to gain it um, initially one-on-one -on -one to help hone in an idea. But when you do, when you're in a group setting and maybe someone does recommend an idea and you build on it, um, what, and so are you t talking within that group, it's a bad idea or just let's say you take it back and you still don't like the idea, maybe to clarify. I'm thinking, it, let's say you were able to open up Blue Bean in like the, the beginning stages and you had 30 people in there who were able to give you feedback at one time. And 20 of those people said, hey, I like this idea. And you think about it and it's just a, it's a bad idea off the start. But 20 of those people like it. They just don't know that it probably would be difficult for you to execute or probably wouldn't work for your business model. Should you try to accommodate that or should you throw that idea out? I will actually flip that to Carlos because I think that happened. Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I Carlos's voice is really quiet. <clears throat> All right. Um, bear with me for a second. Can you hear me now, or is it still? It's it's quiet, but we can hear you. All right, sorry, I don't know what happened with uh, this whole connection. Um, one thing that I would uh, um, sort of mention on that is for, first, I mean, the first step you need to make is you have to realize that if you have a majority of the feedback, then the feedback is accurate, whether it has a positive or I would say an expected or unexpected impact to your, to your project. And I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but you know, again, the, the only reason or the only way that you can dismiss, first of all, again, if you, if you haven't the numbers, then there is a reality check that a lot of people are agreeing to a, a version of the concept. So, uh, you know, the step here is to actually validate then that, you know, if, if you, again, actually in, in a way, if you disagree as a, as an individual, um, if you disagree with the feedback, all you have to or you should do is to continue to validate that with a broader group. That's the only way that you would have to uh, approach something like that. Because, you know, as, as I explained, I think that, uh, you know, the, the story that I'm giving for, for Bluebeam, that's exactly what happened, right? I mean, the, the feedback of the coffee shop was something that I did not want to hear. Um, and, and I actually fought it and fought it quite a bit because um, the, the whole story around me, uh, you know, doing the little squares and, and doing, I did that because I wanted to get rid of the coffee shop concept because again, I was scared of it. Um, it complicated my business model greatly. Uh, I, again, it actually, it made it more complex. It added more cost. It created everything. Um, even actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share even some, you know, some more, more details. Even from the fact of just uh, you know talent, which is one of the biggest expenses in when you're when you're considering to do to open up a business, you know adding a coffee shop added bodies to my business model incrementally, because otherwise a cowork could pretty much operate with just a community manager, right? So you could literally you know uh, deploy it and and be good with just one individual versus now you have to staff, you know, baristas, and then you have to get supply. So all this to say, um, all the feedback, the feedback that I had did not fit my model at that time. The version of my model did not, did not, uh, did not go well with the feedback that I was getting. But the, so then I had to amplify my scope and I had to continue to validate whether and again, in my, you know, this is more from my perspective, right? It's me against the fact that uh, I said, well, this group of people is wrong. I'm going to go and seek some other group of people that I know it's going to be right. And that's when they started validating. And then I had to answer my question, which, nope, the feedback is valid. 
everybody is gravitating to this is validating. So then I had to then reframe my thinking and it was, nope, um, the only way that this is going to be effective is by me incorporating something that I thought was not right. Does that make sense? It does. Perfect for that question too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Carlos, and you had a really good example. <clears throat> uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, um, talking about taking your idea, conceptualizing it, and then working towards a test solution. Um, how do you respond to uh, an idea that is consistently getting mixed feedback? Uh, from like at the end, like the solution or, or uh, maybe give us an example around that. Um, I don't really have a specific example, but just kind of like throughout the whole process, some people really like it and some people really don't like it. And that you could just kind of get that throughout the whole process. Is that something that you stop like in the idea phase and evaluate or do you just kind of keep moving with it and just target that audience that I guess likes it more? Uh, well, so there's a couple of things that you can do. One, uh, as you're getting the feedback and part of, part of this process, which we talked a little bit about is, is you're going to take a lot of the feedback that you get and you're going to theme it. So maybe out of that, um, where you get favorable and non-favorable feedback, um, or kind of mixed bag, it may actually help you design the, the positives and negatives of your potential solution a little bit clearer. So a lot of times we, we try and theme that data to then, to then say, okay, the feedback's telling us our product is this and it is not this. How do we um, alter our concept or our idea to maybe land with both of those? Or, I mean, you may come back to the, to the beginning and reframe the challenge and ask yourself, are we truly solving for a need? Is this something that is valid for the marketplace? Um, and maybe that's where you hate the idea, right? You get such mixed feedback that there's no clarity of around what you're trying to do. And it's potentially just a forced idea. Um, so it really pushes you to say, all right, well, how do I get better adoption? How do people actually love my idea versus, uh, they're so unsure that it, they, no, I'm not going to say truly hate it, but they're just so unsure that they can't even validate what it's doing for them. Um, Carlos, I don't know if you want to add to that, but that would be maybe be the path I'd go. Maybe. Does does that somewhat answer your question? Yeah. Um, a lot of times, so we've said it multiple times. Um, when you get feedback. And it's and it's reality, right? That's what people are feeling or telling you. Listen to it because reality is never wrong. And so this would be where you again come back to your idea and say, enough people have validated this, or enough people have not validated this that we need to make a shift. And that's where the power of getting so much feedback is really good. A lot of times when when we say feedback and maybe you get mixed emotions. Um, you may have talked to four or five people. We're talking, you know, if you want to really get feedback on something, talk to, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30. The more people you can talk to about an idea, the more people you can tell about it, the easier it is going to be to see those trends um, to hopefully eliminate some of that mixed messaging. Um, this would be a good example. So here on the screen, we've got, no, these are donuts. Right, so if we equate this to kind of this whole process we've been talking about. So you, you had a challenge, right? You wanted, well, they wanted to make a pastry, right? So some, create something delicious for people to enjoy um, that doesn't require silverware. Maybe that was one of the pieces. And so when they learned, and this would be where the silverware part came, they learned about, all right, we don't want things to where people want to take them on the go. They don't want to have silverware. It needs to be something easy and people love sweets. Now they're going to start um, thinking of multiple ways to do that. Um, ideating, it could be a, a square pastry. It could be round. It could be a cube, all, all these different ideas. Um, maybe it's delivered. Maybe they pick it up. 
then they're going to land in a concept. And maybe the concept says, okay, we've landed in it. It's got to be something that's baked and it's sweet. Um, what are things relative to this, to this category? And they're going to get feedback again. And so where they land is this MVP. And the, the importance of the MVP in this scenario or this example is when we talk about the minimum viable product, it's just truly making sure that it, it connects and what they're testing for here would be taste, right? So do people like the taste of the donut? And so this is a very easy way through a donut hole to test the taste. So if that checks the box and that's, that's the main function, right? Most people are probably gonna buy donuts um, and, and validate the taste right away. Once that checks the box, they move to the, the MMP or the minimum marketable product. So now they've said, all right, since taste is good, how about the look, uh, the shape? So let's make it a circle and let's make it glazed. And does this hit the mark? So then they're gonna get feedback again. And people say, you know what? Hey, I love the, I love the taste still, love the round donut, but the glaze, the way you've made it, mar or you marketed it or, or made it look, uh, doesn't work for me. I, if I eat this in my car, you know, I get the glaze on my fingertips. It just kind of gets everywhere. It crumbles um, onto my, you know, pants or my seat as I'm driving. It's just kind of messy from a perspective of eating it. So from there, they incorporate feedback and they end with a product or an optimal solution, right? Their, their go to market product, which now checks, okay, it tastes good and um, it's in the shape that people liked and we've reduced the glazed piece and we put frosting on it, which stays together, together better. So now we have, through all this feedback, the right product that solves for the need. People can take this, they can grab it, they can go in their car and they can eat it. So that's kind of the evolution of how you're checking things off. Um, from, from a, uh, this is a product, for example, right? But does it solve the basic need or the function? okay, do, how do we make it look a certain way? What do people think of that? And then if we need to change that, here's what we're gonna change it to, to look the right way to be deployed within the market. So I know that's, I mean, donuts, but it's a really great example of how the process evolves from testing for the need all the way to deploying a product. Are there any questions around that? Uh, maybe one thing that I would also add, and uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me again? I don't know what's happening yeah. with it. Yep. It's muting me. It says the host, it's muting me, but anyway. It's much better, much better now. <laughs> okay. So uh, one thing that I would also show in this example of the donut, uh, going back to, you know, what we talked about, maybe the feedback being something that you didn't expect or want to hear. Um, so this story actually resembles something that uh, happened uh, in, in reality. So once and again, uh, you may think that it's not such a big deal with, you know, the recipe of a donut. But trust me, if you if you ask anybody who owns a donut shop, they they're obviously going to assume and believe that their recipe is the best. But uh, to the story was that once they deployed, the taste of the donut was amazing. And uh, when uh, so every I mean, again, the own ownership was really happy with what was happening. But when they started doing the feedback loops, they started getting. The, the, the feedback that, um, and, and started to realize through the feedback that people were buying donuts. And actually, and this is obviously it's going to resemble to many of us who, uh, you know, eventually go to, you know, get some donuts. Um, a lot of the consumption of the donuts happens at the car, in the car. And so the feedback that started happening was, you know, your donuts are amazing. It's just that when I'm driving to work or going to school, it makes a mess, right? Because I'm, I'm driving with one hand, I'm enjoying your your donut with the other, but then I have to get napkins and I feel sticky. And so the feedback wasn't necessarily around the flavor, but it was actually around the experience in which they were consuming the product. So this could be an example of where, you know, feedback could be dismissed, um, you know, by saying, hey, you know what, this isn't really, I mean, actually it's, it's sort of like your problem, not necessarily mine from, from a, you know, owner, a, you know, pr producer of the solution. Or you really tackle this and say, okay, well, now I'm understanding how my product and an and optimal solution actually gets deployed. Let me try something new. So then when you, when you look at the product, the glaze, you know, the, the, the hard covering that doesn't make a mess, 
that's why they did that evolution from glaze to the non-sticky sort of uh, packaging of still flavor on top of the donut, if that makes any sense. And that, um, I can't, I don't know who asked it, but where you asked if feedback's not favorable, right? That again plays into that point of Carlos saying they didn't give feedback on the taste, but they gave feedback on the shape, look, feel of it. Um, that's where you may think um, that feedback isn't favorable to you, but you still need to acknowledge it and understand it and vet out the feedback you get because that really helps shape um, or round out the actual solution which you're creating. Yeah, maybe one thing that I would, uh, and, and I think you may have heard me say this before, um, you know, especially for the question or the sort of situation of what happens when the feedback is not what is expected. So I'm, again, I'm going to play a little bit the devil's advocate and say, let's not say that it's wrong, but it's, let, let's just say it's not what, what you expected. The rule that we go by, uh, you know, that the, the rule that we really deploy is reality will never be wrong. So it doesn't matter really what you think. Reality will never be wrong. So make sure that whatever your action items and, and next steps are, are aligned and as close to reality as much as you can. So if you have that perspective, I think that that will actually help you uh, sort of manage those situations in which, I mean, if the question is, um, I mean, do we, do we actually, is this right, wrong, or, or is my source right or wrong? Try to answer it from that argument statement and saying, is this reality? And if it is, then that means that, um, that it's right. I, I would say, um, well, We'll just visit the, the last slide we have here. Again, this is just the process, right? So starting, starting with the challenge, defining the true need, learning, um, uh, you know, understanding what opportunities may be out there, ideating, dreaming of possibilities and designing for extremes, creating some concepts uh, and, uh, and understanding what those are, and then testing your solution. And the biggest theme or the constant around all of this is getting feedback throughout the entire process. And at the end, it is coming back and seeing if the optimal solution you've landed on connects with the challenge you're solving for or if you need to reframe your challenge. Um, so maybe with that, we would just say if anyone has any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Well, let me ask you about, uh, when it comes to the optimal solution, um, it's a, that's a little bit of a, um, tongue in cheek in a way when you put it up against this whole process because it's only temporarily optimal, right? Like you have to be willing to say it's optimal today and maybe it's optimal for the next 12 months because we need to kind of run with it for a while, but it, it might not always, we can assume it's not going to always be optimal, right? Correct. So, and that's a great point. And that's the reason we use even the word optimal, right? So that meaning the optimal solution, it's, it's right for the current conditions in which you have or the challenge you're solving for. As things evolve, as your business changes, or maybe you add a function or want to shift your products, then a new solution may be required. For us, no solution is ever final. Um, there's always iterations to, to happen. A lot of times from an organizational standpoint, what we see in businesses is people check the box of finding a solution. They say, hey, I need a phone system they do a little bit of research, they incorporate a phone system and that's it, they check the box. They don't come back to it. And 20 years later, they're saying, man, this phone system has been terrible. Why are we still using it? It's because they don't continue to evolve their needs based upon their current um, reality or the current um, just needs of that organization, right? And so being open to understanding that no solution is final and that you may come up with an optimal solution today and a week later, it may not work, right? So a really good example would be, let's say on March 9th of this year, you came up with a solution on how teams are going to collaborate. And literally eight days later on March 17th, when pretty much the whole country shut down, your solution was no longer optimal. And now you had to recreate and come up with a new solution. Now that's a very drastic impact on the business, which forced a different solution to be created. Um, maybe about how teams collaborate, right? It's not in person with sticky notes anymore. It's virtual with, you know, virtual whiteboards. 
But again, that just shows how conditions can change in which a different solution may be required. And in business, those aren't as drastic all the time, right, as, as a pandemic, but understanding that there are contributing factors or things that may need incremental shifts, not necessarily a complete revamp, but being um, open to seeing those and changing whatever solution that you've created. Have you guys found that some industries are better at um, this process of being willing to, you know, come up with optimal solutions, but then being willing to relook at them. And then <clears throat> basically, are there some industries or some types of leaders that, that gravitate more towards being proactive with this and some that really just have a very hard time with it? Have you guys run into that with any of your clients? Yeah, I think. I, yeah, go ahead, Carlos. No, I, I so I, I think the the answer is going to be yes. There's going to be some thought leaders and and that they're they're in sort of in the industry of disruption. And actually, maybe this is going to be an unexpected one, but um, the startup world is exactly that, right? So if you really want to have a, uh, a an example of a a, um, a category or a section that is constantly working and getting things better would be the startup world. Now that doesn't really respond to your question as, is there a company right now? But I would say there's definitely a community that is focused on doing that. Now, granted, I'm not gonna say that every single startup hits the mark on like, again, that transformative change, but that's what in, in the way, that's what they're in it for, right? It, they're really trying to make this huge shift from A to Z from, and then pick your category usually right now, and the, the, obviously the common theme is technology. Um, but you, we do have some examples um, of how the change, you know, and, and being progressive. And I think actually you've heard us uh, say this quite a bit, but the one that we'd like to bring up uh, quite a bit is Chick-fil-A. Uh, I mean, Chick-fil-A is a really good example of a company that has um, made it uh, part of their mission to be, you know, disruptive and innovative in the category in which they reside. And again, they're competing. Well, actually, they're not competing anymore. They're, they're leading with things that any of their competitors could actually do, but they've been so, uh, uh, you know, it, it's so systemic for the other ones um, to operate that the com competitive and comparative uh, gap is just huge, which is service. They, they operate technically, and I'm going to say technically because the reality, I, I don't think that's a personal opinion, right? But they, res they technically reside in the fast food industry, by they, but they beat everybody through customer experience. So it's, for us, it's a, fun it's a fun example to show how this company, you know, the, the, their biggest strategy is customer experience, not necessarily the next rocking, you know, chicken flavor that, nuggets that you're going to have. Um, and then here's the other thing that I would answer that question, Jared. The bigger the organization, the harder it is. So expect, you know, transformative change less in bigger organizations just because of their mere size, right? And I mean, you've, you've probably heard, and I think everybody, we've all heard and this, this sort of saying, but, you know, to steer a Titanic is not easy, right? You can't just bank left and avoid the, the, the iceberg. So uh, that's, that's why even, even now, when, when you talk about making something, there is a really good, and this is, this is something that we actually uh, deal quite a bit with, with Jeff is, in growth, one of the things that we throw out as a red flag when we do have a sense that a company is about to go from big to bigger is letting them know that the agility, the coasters may actually break. Meaning, you know, you're gonna have a really, really big machine it doesn't matter if you have coasters, there's no way you're going to be able to push it anyway. So I think size has quite a bit to do with it. So, but again, the change is always there, but that's when we make the differentiation between are you making incremental changes versus transformational changes? And some big organizations in a way incorrectly tout innovation efforts through that, again, incremental change. So there are obvious things like, you know, we effectively got all of our team members to start working from home and leverage Zoom in one day. It's like, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's good for you, but it's really nothing out of the norm, right? Versus a company that says, okay, we've learned so much 
we're not coming to work. We're, we're, we're going to then I would give you another example, you know, Twitter. I mean, you know, some companies that are really taking change from that transformational lens when they're paying attention to the greater benefit rather than the how does that this not really fit into my current model. And I'm going to I'm going to end it with one thing. Um, I think for us, it's funny when they say, you know, when we hear um, we, we and we, we just had to actually talk about, you know, uh, a lot of people are starting to use the uh, when we go back to the new normal. Um, we actually believe that there's no such thing, right? You, you cannot have a new normal. You have to have a better normal um, because having a new normal means that you've actually let somebody else design it for you. That's good. And maybe one thing to tag onto that, Jared, would be that I don't know, if, well, it's not related to a specific vertical or an industry. A lot of times to want to go down this path or or adopt that, solutions seem to change it's all about the mindset and so when we connect with clients and and we do a lot of vetting on the front end right one of the things we we check off is their is their mindset if they're if they're ready and willing to change because if not um we jokingly say we don't you know we don't get paid to argue with you and um it, it's not going to be right for them but it's not going to be right for us but knowing that their mindset is there, you know, they're curious, they're resilient, they have empathy, they, they want to actually change makes a big difference. And kind of to this last slide that's up there, you know, if you're ever going to contribute in solving a problem, um, which everyone does daily, whether they're micro problems or macro pro problems, um, we really try and embody that we fall in love with the challenge and someone else owns the solution. So it allows us to take a very objective stance and truly finding the best possible solution for the problem, for the person, for the experience, whatever it may be, but someone else owns the solution and that's usually through feedback. So the end user pretty much owns the solution that's creative, not us. We just are addicted to solving the problem. That's good. That's great. It's great perspective. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah, Max. Um, back when uh, Carlos was talking about um, that reality is always right uh, through feedback, um, how how can you tell if the um, your perception of what reality is is correct? So, like, if you're if you're getting feedback from people and you're getting um, like all positive feedback, how can you tell if you're not like, how can you tell if that is, that perception is real or how can you keep yourself from, um, like we talked about in class, having like an echo chamber where you're just kind of getting yeses to all, all your questions. Um, I mean, is that something where you just broaden your, your base of feedback? I'll let Carlos say I'll let Carlos answer that. Jared, I have to jump off and take okay. your daughters to school. So thank you guys. Right. But I'll let J uh, Carlos answer that. Great. Thanks. Um, so I would, I would definitely say it is def it is definitely a numbers game. So uh, again, so I think that the, the two sayings that go well together is reality is never wrong and perception is reality. So um, that's something that um, I, I, I actually I really like your 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 argument here because um, sometimes when we actually make those mentions and especially those statements, um, you know, a lot of people like them. I think that it, it brings the concept home, but it's not that easy to digest. So actually, I appreciate you bringing it back. Um, the it, it really becomes a numbers game, and that's why I, I went back to the to the example of. Um, sometimes the, the, the mindset, the, the perspective has to be changed on your side as the sort of like the designer of the solution. However, though, I'm, I'm going to give something and maybe this is going to be unexpected. And by the way, Jared, obviously you're, you're, you're recording this, right? Yes, I am. Okay, because actually this may be really good for any, any, anyone who wants to continue to listen to the, the counter argument of this. So I'm also going to give an example of a design that actually said in a way said, no, 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 no. We're actually going to change the perception. So I'm going to go back to Apple. When Apple started testing the screen interface, the feedback was horribly uh, negative to the adoption, right? 
they had so much uh, feedback around, well, people aren't going to get accustomed to this. People, and again, people were saying this. They were saying, no, we need to have that tactile, uh, you know, uh, um, um, sort of, uh, uh, um, I forget what it is, what's the right terminology, but they needed to have this sense of the keyboard, just like back then BlackBerry had it. We need to have that separation. That, so it, they, they had so many uh, data points that said, this is not going to work. You expanding your entire screen and making this, the, the keyboard in the actual screen was absolutely a bad idea. But the design then sort of shifted and adopted one more element, right? So the, the user experience, they already knew that they were, it was, it was going to be hard. But then th what they needed to revisit their challenge was that their challenge was not just about creating the new technology that incorporated, you know, a complete screen and the keyboard disappeared. They needed to incorporate a culture shift. And that was a huge undertaking that a Apple went through that actually it's not really much known. So the, the, the psychology that went into the marketing was probably one of the most expensive deployments around technology that Apple, Apple ever had. Um, so that would be an example where I would tell you that at the, so, um, and again, I'm, 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 I'm really gonna praise you for bringing this back because your thought process is what actually can set you up to really become an innovator, right? Somebody who looks at the reality and you're not okay with it. Now, granted, your effort will be quite more uh, um, severe. So when Apple deployed this, they went against the odds, but then they made it cool and they made it wanted and they started making so many improvements to the user experience that people started adopting the inconvenience that we still live. I mean. Think about the, the number one problem that we all have and we have actually stopped complaining about is the dirty screens, right? Everybody at the beginning, that was the number one complaint. And by the way, Apple went the route and actually a lot of technologies are still going the route to trying to create some sort of a glass surface that doesn't capture fingerprints the way that any glass surface does. But we've actually, as a society, uh, have uh, successfully muted that uncomfort, you know, uh, uh, point to for the benefit that was created additionally. So the value add was greater. Another thing that I'm gonna just highlight as an example is one other thing that critiqued the most was actually the fragile aspect of the product. So the feedback was again horrible because they said, "What do you mean we're gonna start putting?" pieces of glasses in people's pocket, those things are going to break. And those things are, I mean, we're, I mean, talk about, the, you know, just imagine how the, the, the life expectancy, they talked about kids, they're like, well, that's going to be dropped. So again, the illusion here, and I don't know if you guys are going to agree or disagree, but a lot of us actually, uh, you know, purchase the, you know, a cell phone for two main reasons. Obviously, I mean, I'm going to make a little bit of fun with it. You know, how many cameras it has? I mean, it's got 20 cameras, I want and then the other one is, you know, the look, right, the slickness of it. But the, the interesting thing is that the slickness of the cell phone usually doesn't even last for a day, not even for 30, you know, 30 minutes, because the first thing that you do is cover it up. Why? Because you don't want to break it. You want to make sure that you secure it. So here's a really good example that I think it's going to help you um, sort of make the counter argument to what, what we also said. Um, there are ways that you can do this, but it's not an easy design, right? You have to make the value so great that people are okay in taking some of these uh, extra and maybe unwanted steps. Right? And I'm going to finish it with one more thing. Think of the, the 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 fanatic, you know, response that Apple has that people are willing to make lines for days in order to get their hands on the next piece of glass that they need to cover up and put it in their pocket. So that's, a, that, again, that's a, that's a completely different approach. Apple is no longer just a technology, you know, they don't only produce technology, they're also a culture incubator, if you will. So I'll stop and actually get some reactions from you guys. <clears throat> yeah. 
Well, that's a great example. I mean, it it, it does illustrate the fact that um, it could go either way. Like you, if you have enough feedback, you could have an idea that goes kind of counterculture for a while, but the feedback, I think you used the word validate earlier, um, the feedback really validates whether or not you should take the risk, I guess. We've been talking about risk in one of the other classes. Take the risk of going after that optimal solution. Yep. Excellent. You guys got any other questions? Just a comment that that's pretty much exactly what we've been going through in the five stages of decline. We've been watching the, the successful companies versus those who haven't been successful. Those successful companies, I mean, Apple, one of the most successful companies of all time, and they have obviously taken risks. That's one of, one of the things that, you know, Carlos, you're talking about, because that's a risk to go after that new interface with a you know, touch screen. It's never been done before, and it's you know, against most odds. But I'm sure that it wasn't just jumping into the idea without serious consideration and probably very careful little steps to get there. So they're probably, I would say, definitely mimicking uh, the success of other companies who have, you know, that have been the success stories in the book that we're going through. Yeah, yeah, he's referring to the book uh, How the Mighty Fall by Jim Collins and it's been really a, a good study in businesses that have and have not adapted, so. Yeah, it's um, actually, you know what, I, um, now you got me intrigued on the book, so it's gonna be my next read. Yeah, great. Well, Carlos, thank you very much for the time today. You gave us a little bonus bonus time. I'm gonna get this uh, uploaded as a YouTube video and share this last 20 minutes with the class. So we'll, I'll touch base with you later and we'll set up a time to do a debrief and maybe um, discuss the project side of this a little more later on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if there's anything, any other questions, obviously I think that you guys are gonna see that we have quite a bit of passion around this, but uh, thanks for sticking around. This was really fun and can't, can't wait for some feedback. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Carlos. Have a great day. You do the same, guys. Have a good one. All right, bye.